If you have been following the worship guide, if you have been following the Wednesday email, some of you have already seen what the sermon title is today. The Princess Bride <laughs> holds a very uh, unusual place in my life. Uh, I remember first seeing that film back in the last century <laughs> when uh, we had it on VHS. I think the first time that we uh, got it, uh, I was with friends, and we had rented it from the local grocery store. You remember when they used to have uh, the, the, the displays with all the, the different cassettes you could look at? And it was always frustrating, too, because all the good movies, they didn't have, you know, they had just the, 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 the boxes, but the, the movies had been checked out. Uh, kids, you don't know what we went through in the 1980s. I'm telling you, all this instant demand stuff. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. Um, so I remember going over uh, to my friend Tammy Martin's house. She had a bunch of us from the church and school uh, come over that night, and she says, you guys just got, you're going to love this movie. Uh, it's, it's like this kind of a fantasy thing, and there's like, there's like princes and fighting and, and, and kissing, and we're like, this sounds really lame. <laughs> you know, we, we wanted to watch Top Gun or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, this, this doesn't sound good at all. But, you know, it was her house. We wanted to get out. It was something to do. So we said, we'll watch this movie. We'll, we'll, we'll humor you. Uh, and I will tell you, to this day, it's still my very favorite movie of all time. I know that my, my, my childhood self would have said, that's inconceivable. <laughs> but there it is. And... Part of the experience, I have probably, by the time I graduated high school, I think I'd seen that no less than 13 times, <laughs> and you, you always watch it with friends. You watch it, or my kids, like, the Dad, don't make us watch it again. We know all you're going to do is recite the movie, <laughs> but that's kind of part of the experience. You get all these different things going on, and there's all those, those inconceivable lines, as you wish, possible pig. It's, it's, it's conceivable. I might be bluffing you miserable vomitous mass. You know, all the, all the different things. The R-O-U-S's, which if you haven't watched the movie, those are the rodents of unusual size. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of things that are going on in that film, but probably the, the moment that took most of me and my friends by surprise is their Prince Humperdinck, and yes, that was his name in the, the, the movie, Prince Humperdinck has taken Buttercup and they're going to have a wedding. They're forcing her to get married against her will. Uh, she's separated from her, her uh, beloved Wesley. And, and so Prince Humperdinck takes her in to the great cathedral. There's an organ playing. You come into the room. You're looking at all this ornate stuff that's going on. And then the priest comes in. He's got his fancy hat. He's got all the, the gold stuff going on. He solemnly looks over the crowd. And then the music stops. Mowage. Mowage is what brings us together today. And he has a lisp, and he just goes on and on, talking about these things. And, and he's going on long, long. There's a plot going on to try to set Buttercup free, and the people involved in the ceremony understand what's going on. And finally, the... the the priest, he's going long, probably like I'm going to do this morning, <laughs> and says, and so treasure your love, and it will follow you forever and ever. And, and the prince is getting frustrated. He says, say man and wife. <laughs> and it's man and wife. <laughs> and that's what's going on. Now you say, what does that have to do <laughs> with Genesis chapter 2? I could say nothing, it's just my favorite movie, and I wanted to <laughs> share that with you. But the priest did have a point. It was marriage that is bringing us together here today as well. And we are going to talk about those things, because in the end, if you remember in that film, Wesley helps his bride know, his beloved know, you aren't really married. Well, we had the ceremony. The priest said, man and wife. And if you've seen the film, why does he say it's not true? It never happened. Because you didn't agree to it. You 
didn't commit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Marriage is not something that's forced upon us. Marriage is something God created for our blessing, for our benefit, but it's also something we have to enter into, we have to remain committed to. We have to get in a frame of mind where just like in the characters in the movie did, they can look at each other and remind each other, it's not what I want. It's for the benefit of the other person. How do they tell each other they loved each other? As you wish. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, or chapter 2. Uh, we'll start reading in verse 22 for our purposes here this morning as we pick up uh, after God creates the woman out of Adam's body. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, reading this morning from the English Standard Version. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. You might remember, that's where we concluded last week. And then verse 23, new material. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. As we've mentioned, if you're using that outline in the back of your worship guide to follow along, the point we're going to be making as we start off, as we work through the passage, is that God blessed people with marriage. God is blessing us even today with marriage. He blesses who would, the people who would come to be known as Adam and Eve in this passage. He gives them the gift of each other. And he does this in four different ways that I'm going to try to draw out here from the text this morning. First of all, he gives them the gift of shared pleasure. It says in Genesis 2.23 that Adam says, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Interesting here to this point, we've had speech in Genesis 1 and 2, but who's done all the talking? It's been God. God says, let there be light. God speaks things into existence. God pronounces things good. God says out loud, it is not good that man should be alone. We have speech going on several times. Genesis 2.23 is the very first time we have a human being speaking. And what does the man say? He talks about how pleased he is that God has given him a wife. That God has taken a woman and given him a suitable companion, a suitable helper, someone who completes him, and he completes her. By the way, I should step back here for a moment. It's important for us to talk through this. We are talking about marriage. But that might tempt some of you in the congregation to kind of tune me out. Because I'm not married. I've never been married. I don't want to be married. Or maybe I was married and it didn't really work out. And it's kind of a painful topic. Marriage is given to humanity for a reason. Marriage, even if you're not in a, currently in a marriage or if you're in a bad marriage, marriage, as God intended it, helps us understand not just about each other and how we relate, what God's ideals should be, it's important for us to remember, how does God talk about the relationship between Jesus and his church? Well, there's a lot of different ways that God talks about his relationship with us as his children. He is our father. Jesus models that for us. When we pray, how do we pray? Our father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Models that for us. What's the relationship? We are the children. He is the Father. By the way, that's also a reminder to us. We are coming in the name of Jesus. We are going, taking our requests to the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. There is a Trinitarian view in mind that should reflect itself when we pray. There's a lot of people I hear, and I'm not going to critique you to your face, but I'll remind you of it here. When we pray and we talk to the Father and we pray in your name, it may be well-intentioned, but we're not being technically understanding of what we do. We are praying in the name of Jesus, the one who died on the cross for our sins, the one who satisfied the wrath of the Father so that we can have an audience with Jesus. We can have an audience with God. Jesus is the one who makes that possible. We come in His name. So think through that. Pray in the name of Jesus. Pray reminding yourself of what He did for you and what you have. You say, well, God isn't God one? Yes, and God's not going to judge you and say, okay, technically that wasn't correct, so I didn't hear any. I just tuned the rest of that out. Sorry, buddy. No, but it helps us to think through the benefits. Because God talked about it enough to give us those details in the Bible. That's important. Okay, step back. Stop following the rabbit trail here. We have a relationship with God as our Father. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We have examples in both Old and New Testament. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, restores my soul, leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We have that relationship. He is caring for us as the shepherd cares for the flock. The shepherd lays down his life, Jesus says, for the sheep. It's an important relationship. But none of us have ever been sheep. A lot of us here today, it's good for us to think of the Father and we as His children, but sometimes that's a little bit different. The older we get, we know we need to come with childlike faith, but we don't always remember what it used to be like. We look at the kids, we look at the grandkids, and kind of start to awaken some of those feelings of dependence and reliance but we have to give some thought to it. Here is where Jesus gives us another relationship to consider. And we see, for example, in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives. And how does Paul tell us to love our our wives, husbands? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Understanding the marriage relationship, and what it should be like. Understanding, wives, submitting to your own husbands as we, as great believers, submit ourselves to Jesus Christ and to His truth is important. It's a context, it's a relationship that we can see ought to be that certain way. Just like the human relationship gives us a visual Uh, a way to relate to how Jesus relates with us, that's important. Whether or not you have a spouse, whether or not you are currently married, it gives us a venue to understand our relationship with Jesus Christ, how we should respond. So think about that. Don't tune me out just because this doesn't directly apply to you. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, in some way, what we're talking about here does depend on you. It does relate to you. So, we have shared pleasure. The way that we see in our society, and here's a way that some of these things that God intended dilute themselves, distort themselves, degrade themselves. Because what? God created us for shared pleasure. The man is expressing his satisfaction, his excitement, his pleasure at the creation of the woman, the one that God has given to him. We could talk in this context about physical relationships and different things like this. 
I think most of us understand what that, that's all about, and I don't need to go into great detail about that now for these purposes. But, what do we see distorted in our society to, today? So often, and I deal with this with people coming into my office all the time, we have a ministry that meets here in these buildings regularly where people struggle with things like pornography. Struggle with things like even before this, this is because this is certainly not a new sin that just manifested itself in the last decade or two, with fantasy, with allowing their minds to go, allowing pleasure of self to continue in such ways where they are enjoying and experiencing things in isolation and not with the partner that God intended, not in the context of marriage, which is a shared pleasure in physical intimacy, yes, but there is more to it than that. You don't just get married so you can have that experience. If that's what you enter into, you're not really enjoying and experiencing everything that God wants you to. Not unlike, if we think about it this way in our relationship with Christ, we just got together and sang. And we had, many of us had an enjoyable experience singing praise to God, enjoying the benefits of worshiping Christ together as a congregation. That's a benefit of the experience. We're speaking to one another, as Paul tells the Colossians in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. But that's not all our collective experience is as a church either, is it? Paul talks about how we need to bear one another's burdens, how we need to show love, how we need to be generous, how we need to work out differences and conflict. Because that happens a lot. He says, that's why he has to say in the, to the Philippians, I beseech you, Odia, and I beseech Syntyche to be at one mind in the Lord. That's a church context. That means there's even going back to the first century, Christians found ways not to get along. They didn't always experience the pleasure of fellowship. Just like God intended couples, married couples, spouses, husbands, and wives to experience the pleasure of being together. But we have problems. We have sin that creates conflict, that creates division. Not the way God intended it. He gives us the unity and expects us to do the work so that we can maintain it. So that we can keep it. It's a shared pleasure, but people find ways to break it. People find ways to distort it. We see the next example on your uh, worship guide, if you're using that outline to follow along, is that there is God's intention of a shared partnership. He says in verse 24, Moses writes, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, the King James word says you leave and you cleave to your wife, and they should become one flesh. So then again, there's that reference, perhaps at least in part, to the physical relationship. But again, it's not limited. There's a mindset that happens there of shared partnership. God made man and woman, husband and wife, to have a loyal connection. The word that we often use here is a marriage is a covenant. It is a promise. It's more than a contract, although there's certainly a contractual obligation to it. But there is an agreement. We are going to stay together. We are going to look out for each other. And there is that sacrifice. There is that as-you-wish kind of aspect that we talked about at the beginning. I'm going to do things for your benefit, not because it satisfies me, but because I know it's, uh, it ministers to your needs. It serves what you want. I'm going to do that because I love you, because I care about you. And how have people distorted that? In the Ten Commandments, what does God have to confront right from the beginning? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's a breaking of the promise. It's not just committing a sexual sin, although often that's what is the, the mark, the culmination of the adulterous mindset. But it's a breaking of the covenant. It's a breach of trust. 
It's a feeling of betrayal. And friends, God hates that. That's why Jesus says for a man to look at a woman with lust in his heart is to commit adultery. It may not be the consummation, it may not be the final act, but you have allowed that mindset that you're breaching the covenant. You're entertaining other things. Now, God can forgive, God can restore, and God does restore, just like a husband and wife have to sort through those things and determine where have you allowed your attention to stray, where does it need to come to come back, just like we can, by the way, understand that Christians can have that same thing in their relationship with Christ. Why does Paul tell us in the epistles so often to flee fornication, to let your mind be set on things above, not on things on the earth? Covetousness is idolatry. Why does he say those things? Because he understands anything taking the place of Jesus in your mind and in your heart is, in effect, spiritual adultery. That's why James says in his epistle, he actually rebukes his audience and says, you are adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You're loving someone else when you should be motivated purely out of love for Christ. Taken in the marriage context, it is not good for a spouse to have a wandering eye. It is not good for a spouse to be confiding in someone else on a regular basis thoughts and dreams and feelings that they should confine to their husband or wife. That's a betrayal of trust. That's a betrayal of the special relationship they should have with only each other. In the marriage vows, there is that sense of partnership, but also a commitment to permanency. Marriage is meant to last a lifetime. When we go through weddings, and that's the next point on the outline, shared partnership, shared permanency. Because in the, the marriage ceremonies that I've conducted often through the years, we use traditional phrases in the vows, like, I will cleave to you solely till death us do part. Or, I am going to be faithful to you alone as long as we both shall live. And that is reflective of principles that we see in both the Old and New Testaments. This example here is where God establishes marriage in Genesis chapter 2. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 7.39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. Jesus says the two shall be one flesh, just as it says here in Genesis chapter 2. He's quoting from the Pentateuch. In Mark 10, verse 8, he says, So no longer are they two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. God created marriage, and God created the specific institution, the specific covenant that you have come to, that you have taken in those vows with your hus husband, with your wife. And so in Mark chapter 10, he actually talks about and condemns the practice of divorce. He says, whoever divorces, this is Jesus talking, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, I know some of you are here saying, oh, this is not comfortable now because I've gone through those steps. I've taken that. Number one, I'm not going to make a case from Scripture that divorce is always wrong. Divorce is condemned, but divorce is what? It's adultery here. And if adultery has taken place, if unfaithfulness and a breach of the contract has taken place, sometimes there are no other good options but to end it. That's important for us to say. And we're not just talking sexual misconduct. Sometimes that can be a breach of trust, a breach of the covenant, because you have promised in that marriage to be putting yourself out for the needs of the other. 
And maybe one partner is abusing the other, putting them in harm's way, not caring for them like they need to be, and endangering the wife, endangering the children that have been produced in that marriage. Or there, is, there, there are reasons we can talk through these things. But in the way, friends, that is a sort of adultery too. There's a sort of unfaithfulness that reaches us and draws us to that conclusion. But, that is still a distortion of God's perfect intention. It's brought on through the reality of sin. Sin is what causes these destructive things. The counterfeits that people try to offer. God wants permanency. We call for divorce. God wants pleasure and partnership. We commit adultery. We gratify ourselves personally and in isolation. We also see the fourth letter P here is God created marriage for shared posterity. You don't see it particularly here explicitly said, but he does talk about one flesh. And Adam and Eve joined the one flesh relationship will uh, happen in chapter 4. Uh, Eve will say, I've gotten a man from the Lord. They've had offspring. They have Cain and Abel. And then later on, Seth and some of the others that they have there. We'll talk about that at the appropriate time. For now, though, we see that the one flesh relationship results in offspring. It results in procreation. And the venue that God created for that is married couples. Married couples are supposed to bring in children into the Word with a father and with a mother who are going to care for them, point them, raise them up, as it tells us in the New Testament in Ephesians 6, Fathers in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's a father responsibility, first of all. But how has society corrupted that and demeaned that? One way I would suggest to you that we do that is through the reality and the commonality that we've seen in this country with abortion. And we've had whole new fights opening up with that on the political realm here in this country, even though Roe versus Wade has been overturned, it's opened up a whole new realm of questions and a whole new realm of applications. But biblically, there's a problem because often that's not really seen as the, at least the legal decision of the father. He doesn't have him, but he can give his opinion. He can have weight. But so often in the courts and how that's been talked through, it's the woman's body, so it's the woman's choice when those decisions are made. And friends, even though it's murder, and we can talk about that, it's a violation of that commandment too. For our purposes here, God, God created marriage to protect human life. He created marriages, if they're supposed to be functioning well, for a husband and a wife to together collaborate both in the creation of that child, but in the protection and provision for that child. It is for their posterity. So eventually, the children will grow up and mature and maybe help take care of their aging parents, that kind of thing. Not really part of our immediate plan, but that is part of what we talk about when we talk about posterity. The households that God makes, the households we're supposed to care for, and they care for us. They are... God's provision for how we function as families and societies. They are part of God's blessings that he creates us with. Sure, God can help us get back on track if we have deviated from his perfect path. There are some of you, even here in this room, who maybe you are here in your family after your parents maybe get off to a rocky start. You were conceived out of wedlock. You, some of you, are sitting here having brought children into the world outside of a marriage covenant, outside of a marriage contact, uh, contract. I'm not here to condemn you this morning, but I'm sure that many of you could testify through your own experience that hasn't always been the most advantageous thing for you. There have been difficulties that come. You, you, maybe you admire your mom for having gone through, made the sacrifices so that you could have a good life, but having to do it on her own 
was not easy. It was difficult. Because when we go against God's perfection, God's perfect plan, we lose some of the benefits of the blessings that he's given to us. When we treat the relationship as disposable, as optional, or we can enjoy these benefits without the commitment, sure, there's, there's, there's pleasure there. There's, there's, there's positive things that we might think we are experiencing, but we are removing ourselves from what God wants us to do. We are removing ourselves from some of the blessings He also wants us to experience. Friends, whether or not you're married, you need to remind yourselves this is, even though society thinks of it as something antiquated and optional, this is what God intends for us. Just like we should vision ourselves, and we, we delight in the fact that Jesus is firmly committed to us. Jesus, friend, is never going to divorce you. You realize that? that? That's part of what we're getting into the mindset here. When we understand God's perfection in the relationship he's created, the permanency that we should have between a husband and wife for a lifetime helps us understand, in an ideal sense, the relationship that Jesus has for us. When we say, once saved, always saved, it's, I said I do, and I'm not leaving. I'm not going to abandon you. No matter what you do, I am there with you. You are in my hand, and no one can get out of that. That's the hope that we should have, but it's also the sensibility that should inform us when we come to this altar, and we look at each other, and we say, till death us do part. I will be faithful to you alone. Because I'm aspiring to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and the commitment that He has made to me, that's the commitment I'm making to you. These are Christian ideals. These are biblical ideals that mirror the relationship that we enjoy with our Heavenly Father, with our God, with our Savior. And so, friends, whether or not you're married, when you look forward to that, aspire to that. Some of you who are here still picking up the pieces of broken relationships. Be an encouragement and an inspiration to those around you who might, if not given encouragement and counsel, might risk walking in the footsteps that you had. Remind them that God wants us to be faithful. God wants His best for your life. Encourage them in that way. Talk about some of you widows and widowers. The blessings of a shared life together. Don't just lament that they are gone. Talk to other people about the blessings that God gave you when you were together. Talk that up to your children, to your grandchildren. Bless God. You may be sometimes at the table when your family gathers together. Thank Him for those things that He allowed you to experience, to get a taste of what it looks like to invest in other people, for them to invest in you. Don't, as we get working our way through the outline, accept any substitutions for it either. And society wants to say, you know, we can live together, we can give this a trial run. Statistics will show you, by the way, that even though that's common thinking, Statistics show that usually leads to a disposable relationship. It usually trains people to think, not long-term commitment, but if the going gets tough, I can hit the reset button and start over. Marriages that last, that stand the test of time, are because people make an initial commitment and they maintain a lifelong commitment. Statistics will prove that out too. We're not making our case on statistics. We're making our case on what does God want for us. He wants that kind of a commitment. He wants that kind of a relationship. So reject the selfishness. Reject the instinct that you might have. That that person, he or she is being unreasonable. I can't make this work. I just can't stand the pressure anymore. 
I need to get out. I understand some of you don't really have a lot of choice, and I'm not condemning you. Or maybe you look back on your past and you say, I didn't have a lot of choice, Pastor. You weren't there. If you knew what I knew. I've counseled some people, I've counseled some people recently. You have the option. You're not defying God's command to pursue that. But God will be blessed. You will be strengthened. God can give you the power to work through forgiveness and restoration. God can do things. We have to gauge whether or not we're able to let him do that. Whether the hurt and the disappointment and the betrayal is too deep. Friend, whether or not whatever conclusion we might reach in our personal relationships, think back to what Jesus has to do for us. He has promised not to leave us, not to forsake us. The kind of love that he demonstrates time and again, after all the betrayals, after all the disappointment, after all the abandonment, all we have to do is look at Jesus and Peter. He says, Peter, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times. He sees, he knows, Jesus knows that he betrayed him, that he turned his back, that he was unfaithful. He was broken by it, and he was ashamed of it when he saw he didn't want anything to do with him for a while. And yet Jesus did the hard work of reconciling him and gave him the responsibility, gave him a renewed sense of responsibility and commitment. Peter preached that sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And 3,000 souls are added to the church. That's the beauty of restoration. Friends, that's a local church. God can do that in your struggling and broken marriage. God can do that with people who are willing to submit themselves and let the Holy Spirit do the work of restoration. We must reject that selfishness and insist on integrity. The very last verse that we read here in our passage in Genesis chapter 2 talks about how the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. I think there was nothing standing between them. We could talk about that in a sexual context, and certainly there is a sexual context there. But it's not just sexuality that's put on display there for us. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to separate. Everything's out in the open and in front. They're vulnerable to each other, and yet they have a commitment to each other. Nothing stands between. There's no faking, no falsehoods. It's all together. They're all in. Friend, if you're struggling in your relationships, we can mask and we can hide so many things. But a marriage that's going to work, a relationship that's going to work, has to be built on trust. It has to be built on shared experiences. It has to work on being open. It has to be worked on not holding grudges. Learning to forgive. And forgive doesn't just mean I accept your apology. Forgive means I'm not going to hold that against you anymore. How does Jesus model that for us again? As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you, says God. I'm not holding those things against you any longer. That's what forgiveness looks like. That's what we aim for. Friend, when we do that, we can realize we were meant to share. That's what God created us for. In a marriage relationship, that's that final point. We bring our lives together. It's not me and her, it's us. Just like in our relationship with God, it's not Jesus gives me forgiveness and makes sure I can go to heaven. No, that's all true. It's not longer any longer what I do and who I am. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. It's not about me. It's about living for Jesus. 
It's about the priority of his people. And if we can get that right in the church relationship, we will better understand what it takes for a marriage to succeed. And friend, if you can better understand what it takes for marriage to succeed, we can also get along better in the church, realizing we were made to share and live in common, live in the unity that God has gifted to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us that sense of love, that sense of understanding that Jesus himself models, that he gives us a context in which we can understand that. So, Lord, we know that there are broken marriages represented here in a group like this. There are situations that may not always be public knowledge, but we also know because of the universality of sin that you know them and that they are here. Help us, Lord, to have a renewed sense of encouragement, a renewed sense of responsibility, understanding that our selfishness, our sinfulness has contributed to our conflict, to our difficulty, through our hurt and loss and betrayal. You did not intend for it to be this way. You give us the power to overcome those obstacles that we have introduced, to have the slate wiped clean, to have your forgiveness be demonstrated, to have broken relationships renewed and restored. Because you restored the ultimate broken relationship between yourself and humanity through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So Lord, if we can love the bridegroom, we, the church, as his bride, help us also understand it's that kind of acknowledgement and admission that is going to improve and give us marriages worth enjoying, worth fighting for. And we will give you the praise and the glory for what you're going to do in our congregation, what you're going to do in our families, what you're going to do between husbands and wives for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name.